Okay, colleagues, and hopefully we're live. Now, um, I wanted to do a short, well, <laughs> we'll see how short it is. I wanted to do a little follow-up to the um, lecture on John Stuart Mill. So if you haven't watched that, uh, this probably will not make much sense. But still, um, there it goes. Um, so what I, what I meant to do is, uh, um, again, in the lecture, I try to explain the main issues which I consider most important and most interesting in um, John Stuart Mill's philosophy. And um, what I wanted to do now is basically uh, um, dwell on some of the issues around Mill. Now, John Stuart Mill, over the years, has become a very important philosopher for me personally. Now, in principle, I think it is not pedagogical, it is not very pedagogical for a teacher to uh, share his or her views, but um, at the same time, I feel that uh, maybe for the sake of explanation, or, or maybe just to let our to let, let my bias, right, be known, right, to, to admit to my biases, I should say that, again, um, I tend to agree very um, strongly with the um, utilitarian philosophy, especially in the way that John Stuart Mill um, presents it in his um, works, especially work utilitarianism and on liberty as well. Um, and some people think that Mill's philosophy is not very coherent, or maybe that there's a contradiction between on liberty and utilitarianism. I don't, I don't think, you know, that's not my impression. That's not the impression that I'm getting. Uh, um, when I read the work side by side, I have a, like a, an, imp an impression of uh, a, a very uh, um, coherent work, and, and the one I tend to agree with very much. And um, immediately, let me, let me stress, I suppose the mm, three most important philosophers in, in this course for us, so this year and next year, for me, are uh, John Stuart Mill, Karl Marx, and Friedrich Nietzsche. And um, in many ways, I like to read them together in the context of um, one another. And um, I, I feel that there's a basic agreement between the three, right? So... <laughs> uh, Again, I'm not sure if I should be saying this, but, you know, I tend to think of myself as, a, as maybe a utilitarian Nietzschean Marxist. Now, having said that, uh, uh, of course, again, I remind you, colleagues, uh, um, I'm not trying to indoctrinate anyone into, into my prejudice. And, in fact, I believe very much in the dialogical nature of philosophy. And, in general, I do try to keep my you know, opinions out of the classroom. And when I will be presenting this course in a more formal setting on Coursera, as, as I should be starting on, in, in January, um, I will probably, you know, try to phrase all these issues more carefully and, and keep my opinion even more out of the way. But, uh, um, again, I think for the sake of the dialogue, again, keeping in mind that it's sort of, yeah, okay, I, some, you know, I tend to think in Marxist, Nietzsche, and, and utilitarian terms, uh, but at the same time, I, I you know, I um, follow these philosophies very non-dogmatically. I very much welcome free and open discussion. And in, in fact, John Stuart Mill is, is one of the inspirations, right, for this whole uh, uh, intellectual ethic of encouraging free and open discussion, right? So John Stuart Mill is the first person to say that unless you have examined the best arguments on every side of the issue, unless you have done that, you cannot really claim to know what you're talking about. Huh? You, you are not holding a view, you are holding something like a prejudice. Let me... Yeah, okay, so it's working. Uh, um, so, in general, again, I think that, you know, in political philosophy, we should not, uh, you know, bow down before, before authority in any shape, matter, or form. Uh, um, the, only for, the only force that a free person recognizes is the peculiarly unforced force of the better argument, the zwanglos and zwang des besseren arguments, right? And so, uh, again, but, but at the same time, at the same time, um, I want to talk about several 
uh, uh, several issues. And as, I, as, I, as I'm talking about this, I think well, my, my, reading, my reading of these three philosophers is in context of one another. I think that Mill and Nietzsche and Marx are in a basic agreement. This is a strong position and a controversial position on my part. I would imagine that many philosophers, uh, uh, many commentators would disagree with this vehemently and would think that no, there's some kind of unbridgeable gap. But that's not the way I see it. Again, the, the way I see it, I think that there's a basic agreement between the, the three philosophers and it's supremely useful to read them in light of one another because certain parts of their philosophy, like mm, there's, there's an overlap, but also there's a non-overlapping position. So for example, like when we are trying to imagine what this free development of individual would look like, you know, especially in terms of the individual project, this aesthetic view of life, I think, you know, it's appropriate to go to, to Nietzsche. If we want to uh, look at mm, uh, um, ideas of how to organize this politically, I think that Mill is, is our man, right? And, uh, um, you know, he talks about this potential problem of tyranny of the majority and how can we can combat that. And if communist society were ever to be realized, I think John Stuart Mill's advice would be uh, uh, very appropriate, right? The tyranny of the majority, you know, the, the instantiation of real democracy. I don't exactly think that we are still uh, uh, in that position yet. And this exposes my Marxist credentials. I, you know, Mill is afraid of tyranny of the majority. I don't think that you know, most countries in the world are, are ruled in a, in a democratic fashion today. So I don't think we run into that problem yet. But, you know, in, in a communist society, that's definitely an issue, especially this idea of uh, Bentham's panopticon and this, you know, society of surveillance. Uh, um, would you have uh, something like Bentham's panopticon in, uh, um, in communism? And the answer to me seems to be potentially yes, and that's a problem because if we deploy these kinds of uh, uh, disciplinary, di disciplinary uh, techniques, then we should make sure uh, uh, to also engage in some damage control. And uh, um, likewise, Marx, I think, is very important because the project of free development, of free, in, in, uh, free um, development, development of human potentiality that we see in Nietzsche and in Mill, um, I think that this, these projects, until we make a certain transition as a species, the, uh, uh, you know, maybe something like a communist revolution, right? Until we have done that, um, these projects of free self-development can only be exercised in a very, very limited context. So what I'm, what I'm saying in very straightforward terms is that like, we have some like 7 billion plan people on planet Earth, and uh, for the vast majority of them, it's like, like, you cannot, it's, like, it's useless to read Mill or Nietzsche because they, they are not in any shape, matter, or form in a position to develop their capacities, to develop their rich and varied abilities, to develop themselves as individuals, to create their life as a work of art, because um, you know, basically slaves to wage one way or another, the vast majority of the seven billion people on planet Earth. And so in order to understand how, sort of, how can we start reading Mill, uh, Mill and Nietzsche as, as practical philosophers, first we need to get over this transition. Um, is it going to happen? Well, you know, there's this famous slogan, socialism or barbarism. It's a controversial, controversial. I don't want to get so controversial in the beginning of my follow-up. So let, 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 me, let me skip that. Let me skip that. And let me, let me talk about... Uh, um, something in Mill. So there's a whole, the whole, a whole bunch of things um, I want to talk about. So let me, let me maybe start, let me start uh, um, somewhere. Let me, let me start with this very controversial idea in Mill of this idea uh, about children. So um, Mill is, um, is talking in his philosophy in, in, on liberty. He's talking about how um, similarly to Hobbes, in, in, a, in a phrase which is reminiscent of Hobbes, he says that um, some philosophers argue for what he thinks too much liberty, and some philosophers argue for what he thinks is too much authority. So actually, Mill explicitly says that he wants a certain balance between uh, uh, liberty and authority. Balance between liberty and authority. And um, basically, he's saying that uh, uh, right now, as of right now, in certain areas of life, we have too much liberty. On some areas of life, we have too little liberty. So there's uh, too much or too little liberty cu currently, right? Um, and um, this, is, this is a problem for Mill. And so obviously, I mean, a million examples where he talks about how we need more liberty, uh, more free speech, uh, um, more liberty of lifestyles and pursuits. He talks about these issues. But at the same time, he also says, sometimes, mm -hmm, so we need, we need more liberty in, in those areas, more freedom. 
But also, he says, in other areas, we actually need less, less freedom. And one example that he brings up is uh, 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 children, that having a child is not a self-regarding action. Having a child is not a self-regarding action. Um, so having children uh, um, is not a self-regarding action. Um, and basically, we are talking about uh, two issues. So first of all, you need to make sure that you can take care of the child properly. So there's the welfare of the child involved. And secondly, there's the interest of society. Um, and so like, basically, is your child going to be happy? And is your child going, going to be beneficial to society as a whole? Um, yeah, so this is actually also this idea of rights. Uh, utilitarian justification of rights. So uh, is a child going to be a benefit to society and is the child going to be happy? And you see, again, um, you have this notion, especially in people like maybe John Locke and Immanuel Kant, that human life is sacred. And you know, I'm, I'm not sure how to phrase this best, but I think in a deep and important sense, Hobbes is right. Um, by nature, nothing is good or evil. So by nature, is nothing, nothing is right or wrong. So like in principle, in the abstract, in the vacuum, human life doesn't have any intrinsic meaning, intrinsic value. Now, human life has intrinsic meaning and intrinsic value to us, right? So, but, but the justification has to do with our common interest or the question of our happiness, right? If we don't, if we're not guaranteed basic rights, like basic right to life, uh, we cannot be happy as a society, John Stuart Mill thinks, and, you know, convoluted, well, I mean, slightly more complicated technical arguments, but, you know, I'm prepared to defend that, right, on utilitarian grounds. But at the same time, so it's one thing to have a right to life. Right to life is not the same thing as uh, right to have children, right? So let me, let me maybe even add this. So right to life is not the same thing as right to have children. Um, uh, in, a, in an important respect, right to life is self-regarding. Right to have children is uh, uh, other-regarding. Now, let me also immediately... I mean, I mean I'm, I'm, I'm going very slowly over this, and I'll, you'll, have to, uh, uh, you'll have to excuse me for that. But it's like, um, it is not a qu it's not really a question, at least for me, um, of scarcity. There is no scarcity, okay? And uh, 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 in 2020... Mm, there, there is no scarcity, no scarcity in 2020. And uh, as far as I can tell, to the best of my knowledge, it is true that we do not have scarcity. If you, if you think of uh, uh, basic provisions of life in terms of uh, food, clothing, shelter, the world produces more than enough goods to feed everyone, to clothe everyone, even to provide education to everyone, even provide, I don't know, like basic access to internet and, and computers to everyone. Um, this is, uh, th you know, the, the, the reason why people starve, the reasons are political, not economic. Economically speaking, we can provide for everyone. The productivity of labor is through the roof. So it's, it's a question of coordination. And I don't want to, I don't want to uh, uh, minimize the issue, right? So we keep, we keep, I, we keep talking about this in, in this class, right? If, you, if, you, um, if the rich share with the poor, or if rich countries share with poor countries, where is the guarantee that the, that the poor are not going to stab them in the back or that the poor countries are not going to stab them in the back? Now, the way I phrase this uh, probably sounds very crass. I don't mean it exactly in that way, but it's like... Again, we have, to, we have to keep in mind the realist tradition in politics, right? This, this, this idea that when a country gets ahead in economic terms, sometimes they do wonderful things in terms of, I don't know, science, healthcare, and art, and, and, and sometimes they try to acquire nuclear weapons. And both are possible. And uh, uh, mm, you could say, oh, it's a failure of the system. We could transition to this, um, you know, per, you know let's say, quasi-Kantian perpetual peace where, you know, the whole world will disarm, and uh, my answer to you is maybe, in fact, you know, I, I think Marx uh, lays out a certain basic idea of how this in principle can be done uh, 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 in his vision of communism. So, like, I, I don't disagree with that in principle. So I don't disagree in principle that we... And so uh, let, me, let, me, let me phrase it different, right? So in principle, I agree that there, that there probably, probably is a way to transition to this... Uh, um, 
um, <laughs> um, situation mm -hmm, where we get rid of nuclear weapons when you know, people, uh, nations disarm, right? Some form of perpetual peace, right? So, so in principle, I agree with this vision. But the question is, how do you get there? The question is, how do you get there? And before, before there are certain guarantees in place, before there's a certain plan, like in, the, like in this Hobbesian fashion, right? Covenants without swords are but words. Covenants without swords are but words. What are the exact mechanisms that will ensure that if we distribute resources more equitably throughout the world, wh where is the guarantee that these resource resources will be used for, uh, for for common good, for common uh, common interest, right? So uh, um, so the question the question is, where is the guarantee? How can we guarantee uh, that um, more equitable distribution, that uh, a more equitable distribution uh, will be used for common interest? And not and not for and not sectional interest, not sectional interest. Um, so again, I don't think that when we talk about right to life, that this is this is a question of scarcity. Uh, but Mill talks about this, right? The idea is that the more people you have, this is this is straight from Mill's uh, on liberty. The more people you have, the um, more competition you have on the labor market. So more people means more competition. Um, and, and therefore, right, so more people is more competition. And this means lower wages. And again, Marx has this, this is, this is, this is not a quote from Mill, but this is, this is an idea from Marx, this idea of the reserve army of the unemployed, reserve army of the unemployed. Um, and in in general, in general, I think this is this is this is a genuine uh, uh, problem. So this is this is a phrase from Marx. Um, this is a genuine problem in the sense that uh, again, seven we have seven billion people on planet Earth, and approximately six billion of of these seven are, you know are not sharing in the benefits of, uh, by and large, are not sharing in the benefits of progress, of civilization. Like, in, again, in this, in this Rousseauian fashion, I think it's more or less uncontroversial that, you know, for, si for six billion out of seven, you know, it's like, well, I don't want to, I don't want to, I don't want to use categorical language, but it seems, it seems mm, mm, not out of the question, right? It seems vaguely plausible that they live in something like an evil contract and they do not equitably share in the progress of humanity is what I'm trying to say. And the fact that you have uh, poor, destitute workers in other countries, right, who serve as a reserve army, army of unemployed, this weakens the bargaining power of uh, uh, workers in more uh, industrialized, more economically developed nations. And, and this, is, this is an issue. Now, the way Marx proposed we solve this is um, Marx thinks that the, the um, more industrialized countries should lead the way. So Marx, according, according to Marx, the basically um, first, world, first world workers, first world workers should unionize and then help third world workers unionize. Um, How realistic is that? Well, it's complicated, right? Uh, uh, in in many in many ways, the reason workers the reason why this doesn't happen is uh, divide and conquer, right? Divide and conquer, uh, and kind of nationalism is probably the biggest the biggest problem that, that prevents this from happening. I'm, I'm, I understand I'm talking about too many things at the same time. But, you know, if, if some ideas are sticking, that, that's good enough. So uh, let, me, let me go back to this issue of having children, because I'm not necessarily making a lot of sense right now, right? So again, uh, to a lot of people, 
this, this idea that government restricts your ability to have children, this sounds horribly tyrannical and horribly invasive. And you see, what, what I want to say is that um, I think it's an, it, it, it is a problem and, and it is an indictment, but it's not an indictment of Mill, it's indictment of us. So, so, so the problem is not with Mill, the problem is with, with us. Because we live in a society which is so obviously, so horribly wrong, right, that, that, that to, to sort of uh, uh, get out this idea that somehow, by the general will, we can try to restrict the, uh, the population, like this is completely out of the question. And the reason I think, per, you know, so it appears to me at first glance, right, the, the prima facie reason I think is that uh, in most countries of the world today, for the vast majority of people on planet Earth today, um, it, it is very obvious that we live in something like an evil contract, and which you, if you want, you may call a latent civil war, latent civil war. And this idea that mm -mm, if the government would intervene, it would try to intervene um, in, so let me, let me even, even maybe add this to the slide, so latent civil war. So if the government was to try to intervene in such uh, um, intimate, private, personal affairs, there would be riots in the street. People would not take lightly to this. It's like, um, and you know, I feel that again, many countries, most countries are, you know, to, to a greater or lesser extent are on the brink of this kind of latent civil war. Again, I don't mean this. Uh, uh, it's like, um, this phrase should be taken with a grain of salt. I'm not saying that there will be riots in the street tomorrow. I'm not saying that. Partly, the reason I'm not saying that is because the governments are not going to implement such a restrictive policy. I'm not saying, you know, it's like the governments will not um, invade your privacy and therefore, you know, and also incidentally, people will not, uh, you know, hit the, hit, hit the streets tomorrow because there's no reason, by and large. But what I'm driving at is that I think in a well-ordered society, in a well-ordered society, this idea of, look, we have a, uh, a social system that really takes care of you. And we have a political process which is transparent. So if, so we, we live in a civil war, but if, um, so again, so again, so we do not have, so there's no social system that take, cares about us, that takes care of us. And uh, the political process is not transparent, is not transparent, and, and so, so, okay, la lacks transparency. So political process lacks transparency and accountability. And, but, but so the, 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 the flip side of what I'm saying is that I think if there was uh, transparency and accountability, and if people understood the reasons as to why, you know, we need to, uh, let's say, okay, like, if, if the social system, which takes care of you, this, like, a free, um, you know, like, a, a universal right to free healthcare, to high, qual high quality free healthcare, universal right to high quality free education, uh, you know, social security, um, um, unemployment benefits, that kind of thing, right? So if people really understood that the government is taking care of them, and at the same time, political process was transparent, and people understood that, look, there, there, there's a reason how we, you know, we should try non-lethally, right, non-invasively, uh, um, sort of in a consensual fashion, we need to try to reduce the population, because there's too many people on planet Earth, let's try to, you know, think of ways to do that, the, the, the response should, in principle, be different. People should be happy to go along with that because they would understand the, the reasons for this process. Now, it's a separate question, you know, do we have over, overpopulation? <laughs> it's a complicated issue. I don't want to, you know, in, in, in many ways, maybe we can even dodge this whole discussion. This is what Mill is talking about, okay? Mill is talking about how he thinks it's appropriate to restrict the population. Like, is it actually true in the world demographically? It's a can of worms. I don't. I don't necessarily want to open right now, even though I'm sure I already opened it, right? But let me let me try to close this can of worms. Let's not discuss this. But let's let's imagine if there was a situation and we saw, as a matter of general will, and again, notice, notice, I keep using the Rousseauian phrase general will because 
you know, in many ways, I, I like to read uh, um, Rousseau through the prism of Mill and also read Mill through the prism of Rousseau. I think, you know, it's mutually illuminating. Uh -huh. this, this idea, uh, 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 again, like if there's a recognized social necessity, and this is a phrase now from Mill, a recognized social necessity that we need to, um, you know, limit number of children, yeah, of course people go along with this. And um, during the Second World War, because again, Mill talks about liberty, but again, we should have liberty because it provides utility in the long run. Again, during the Second World War, and, and this, is, this, is, this goes back to this issue of what are rights? What kind of rights do we have? Mill thinks, for, uh, Jeremy Bentham has this uh, wonderful uh, um, phrase. He says that, uh, Jeremy Bentham, you know, John Stuart Mill's intellectual godfather, he says that um, <laughs> uh, natural rights is nonsense, um, uh, inalienable natural rights is elevated nonsense, nonsense on stilts, rhetorical nonsense, complete and utter nonsense. And I, again, as a, as a Marxist uh, and Nietzschean, I guess, I tend to agree with John Stuart Mill. There's no, there's no such thing as natural rights. Rights are not natural. Rights are, 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 are artificial. Mm -hmm. So rights are not natural. Whoops. but artificial. And um, th th so there should, be, there should be a reason and a mechanism. So we need a reason and a mechanism to declare something a right. So we need a reason to declare something a right and a mechanism to uh, realize this right. And the reason has to be utilitarian. So we need a utilitarian uh, reason and a practical mechanism. So people have rights uh, uh, because it increases, uh, you know, utility, broadly speaking. Um, I, like, I like Mill's formulation. Let's repeat it again. Again, this permanent interest of man as a progressive being. Um, is it a vague concept? Well, maybe to some extent it's vague, but I think it's precise enough uh, um, to, 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 uh, to, be, to use it in, in practical politics. There are complexities. Yes, life is complicated. So that's true. But, but in general, I think it is, uh, uh, you know, it, it is concrete enough for, uh, for, for, for practical purposes. Again, this uh, uh, permanent interest of man as a progressive being. So again, rights are not natural. Again, right to, even right to life is not natural. Huh? It's ar artificial in the sense that it has to be propped up by society, uh, created and propped up by society. Like in, in the abstract, in the vacuum, it's meaningless to speak of uh, rights. Sort of rights without duties, if you want, are meaningless, and, and duties always have to be enforced by something like a social system. Um, so, mm, anyway, 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 where was I going with this? So, I was talking about, mm, yeah, yeah. So I was I was talking about this restricting right to have children again, this idea of uh, um, uh, uh, recognized social necessity, and. So the, the example I'm talking about, the controversial example, is government invading what we think today as the sphere of negative liberty of this, you know, uh, innermost uh, sacred privacy of the home, decision to have children. And uh, uh, again, I'm, I'm trying to explain Mill's reasoning here, which, and again, like if the premise that we have overpopulation or somehow, you know, um, it would be better for the long-term interest of humanity to, to, to decrease the number of people. If that were true, I think Mill has a case for it. And, and an analogy I want to make is uh, Second World War, Britain during Second World War. Okay, there are different, you know, many countries participate in the Second World War, but since we're talking about John Stuart Mill, let's talk about Britain, right? And um, I think, so when we, when we talk about this, again, notice I, I mentioned uh, uh, transparency and accountability. I think that in principle, like in, in, in general, uh, 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 during the Second World War, there was more transparency and accountability in the sense that people actually felt that uh, uh, what they were doing were act was actually in the common good of, uh, um, of defending Britain, right? And we always have suspicion that um, the powers that be, right, so people who sit in parliament, people who sit in government, we always have this suspicion that maybe they're taking advantage of us. But I think during the Second World War, you know, there was, there was less of this suspicion and there was more understanding that there is a common goal and we are working towards a common goal. And so people saw, uh, you know, evictions or evacuations, people saw uh, uh, rations, right, so, uh, 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 like, uh, um, introducing a system of rations for food or for um, um, fuel, you know, gasoline, 
these were not seen as tyrannical and invasive, right? These were seen as, as again, as a recognized social necessity. You know, and if the government can decide what you have for breakfast, if the government, in times of war, in times of the Second World War, the government can decide what you have for breakfast, and the government can decide what you listen to on the radio, right? Because it's, it is a matter of social security, and it is a matter of recognized social necessity, right? So if the government can decide this, then the government also, you know, in similar circumstances, could be justified in deciding how many children you're allowed to have. This is the kind of uh, uh, general uh, um, framework, general perspective that I'm trying to... Um, build up here or, or, or flash out, right? And so, so what I'm saying is that I think that some countries in some points of time had this notion, and we in 2020, I, I, I not, not, I'm not, I'm not talking for all times and all places, but it, but my feeling, my perception is that most places on Earth today, right, are uh, are you know far from that ideal, and and the reason why we would see government invasion of privacy as tyrannical is because we live in a state of approaching a civil war. And it, 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 is, it is a problem. It is a, it is a symptom of social ill. And I would very much disagree. You know, some philosophers could come in and say no. Like Isaiah Berlin would say no. There's, there's a sphere of um, individual privacy which should be sacred at all costs. And I disagree with it. Again, as you said, I disagree with that completely. You know, maybe the government can, you know, or in general, like society, can set up this, this kind of sphere for utilitarian reasons, but there needs to be a justification. In and of itself, privacy or individuality has no value. It has value only uh, um, if you justify it by appeal to the common interest. Again, this, this, this idea, again, ju justice as the common interest. And let me, let me maybe segue into this, into this issue. So justice as a common interest. Um, and let me let me let me start with the with the question of equality. Actually, um, so why do we care about equality? Why do we care about equality? And in general, I want to say equality is a horrible political ideal. Again, as 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 a, as a as a million and as a Marxist, I think, and as a Rousseauian, I think equality is a horrible political ideal. Who cares about equality? Equality is worthless in and of itself. Equality by itself is completely worthless. Like, I don't know, we can all be equally poor, and that's going to be equally bad. Or we, can only, or, or we can all be equally sick, or equally dead, right? Equality in and of itself is not a good thing. So, equality by itself is um, completely worthless. What's, what's, what's the word I'm looking for, I wonder? Let me, let me write worthless. Uh, what we want is certain kinds of equality, basically because they enable freedom. So, but certain kinds of equality, like equality of opportunity, for example, or if you want, let's have another example, equality before the law. So these are uh, um, important, but only instrumentally are instrumental, are instrumentally valuable for freedom. Okay, so what is then what is then valuable, right? If it's not equality, well. Again, remember, the sort of the uh, general framework of, of this follow-up is Nietzsche, uh, Marx, and Mill. And I think what is, what is valuable for them is, mm, in the words of Mill, this would be this, again, permanent interest of man as a progressive being. Permanent interest of man as a progressive being. Right? So when we say man, of course, with John Stuart Mill, very obviously we mean man and woman. Right, so uh, permanent, let's say permanent human, permanent interest of a human being as a progress. Okay, yeah. <laughs> this doesn't sound very well. Permanent interest of a human being as <laughs> uh, permanent progressive interest of a human being, something like that of humanity. You know what? 
Let me let me stop let me stop trying to rewrite this. So let me let me let me leave it the way no rights about this. Permanence of man as a progressive being. Um, now, um, so we are talking about free development. Uh, free development of rich of our of individual individual um, ability in conjunction with others. And again, we have this uh, quasi, so say hi to Aristotle, we have this Aristotelian ideal uh, that human beings can become properly human and properly happy. We become properly uh, human and properly happy um, only by productively, constructively engaging with others. Only through constructive engagement with others. So again, this, this uh, 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 t togetherness, right? Uh, pro-social, in some in some pro-social way or pro-social form. And mm, John Stuart Mill talks about this. So many many you know philosophers in his day thought of utilitarianism as a philosophy for swine. Philosophy for pigs, right? And and Mill was deeply appalled at this. He says, "Yes, of course, the only thing we seek in life is pleasure, but that's the whole point. We are humans; we have higher pleasures, not pleasures of pigs." So I should uh, probably immediately add this idea: so, okay. higher, higher versus lower pleasures. And in many ways, this is this is this is the way for me to read uh, Marx and Nietzsche. And I think both Marx and Nietzsche have this notion that the vast majority of people on planet Earth today are engaging in lower pleasures uh, and are forced to engage in lower pleasures, but why? Not necessarily because they want this, but more likely because they are forced to by the social circumstance, right? Uh, um, as John Stuart Mill says, right, so this, this uh, um, feeling, this um, capacity to experience higher pleasures is a, is a delicate flower that needs to be cultivated. And in most souls and most people alive today, this, this flower is, is broken while they're still young, right? It needs, needs to be sheltered and protected from the, from the outside world. Um, well, not from the outside world, you know, cultivated. Uh, not just protected from the outside world, but also needs to be cultivated with the help from the outside world. Um, so, yeah, and, and again, and, and, and the, reason, the reason why individual human development is good is because uh, I would say that um, uh, Mill and Marx definitely, but I, I would argue Nietzsche also as well, as well have this idea um, of um, human freedom, of human nature as ultimately pro-social. The way, the way I develop myself as a human being, the way I become happy, um, is by doing something wonderful, wonderfully constructive, like uh, writing a book or, you know, giving the best lecture I can give or, you know, winning a Nobel Prize. You know, it's like, think, think of all the, you know, best people humanity has to offer. I don't know, people like, I don't know, uh, Cecilia Payne, wonderful um, astronomer, or Albert Einstein, or, you know, Jocelyn Bell, or, I don't know, it's like uh, Isaac Newton. These people did not work for money. So the, 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 their, their motivation was because sort of engaging in this wonderfully productive activity uh, uh, um, had intrinsic value for them. And, and this, is, this is what Marx and Mill, and I think Nietzsche also think, right? So this idea that there's this wonderful creative potential inside of us, and sort of what really makes us happy, what makes us, okay, so we talk about higher level pleasures, let's continue. So what really makes us happy is the development of our creative potential, is the uh, unlocking uh, um, the... Um, blossoming of our creative potential. What really makes us happy is the blossoming is the uh, uh, of our creative potential. And again, notice how um, science um, and technology in general, but especially science, is a non-rival process in the sense that People 
um, yeah, of course, there's, there's competition. There's competition, especially within the way we do science today in a capitalist economy. But in general, science is much more cooperative than it is competitive. Or, that, or let's say it's much more about consensus than it, is, than, than it is about conflict. Yes, of course, of course, scientists compete for glory. But in general, it's like you benefit from having wonderful teachers. You benefit from having wonderful colleagues. And you even benefit from having rivals who push you, you know, forward to do greater and greater things. Right? And um, um, it's, it's, like, it's, it's very important that in science people are able to exchange ideas and uh, uh, you know, to refer to one another, let's say in scientific papers, without like, paying royalties or you know, you know, pay, paying copyright. So it's not, it's not like you know, Einstein wanted to patent his idea and let no one use it. No, like you, you, you want to share with everybody. And again, if you imagine a good writer who writes a novel or, or, or a you know, talented painter, they want to show their painting to as many people as possible. Uh, um, or, or at least, you know, I feel with, with Nietzsche, with Marx and with Mill, is, is that that is what creative potential should be about. Like if you want to hold it back from everybody else and not let anybody see it unless they pay you, well, that doesn't sound like a definition of an artist, uh, of a true artist to, 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 to me. Maybe I'm old fashioned in this sense. Um, so, um, yeah, let me talk about, well, okay, 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 so where, where was I going with this? So I don't know, this was, the, 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 the title of the slide was this idea that, that we should, that, that justice is defined by common interest. Justice is defined by common interest. And I, and I think, you know, in many ways, this is the most productive, the most workable definition. And justice is defined by common interest and also rights are defined by common interest. So rights. And it's like, uh, if we ask ourselves, like, what kind of rights should people have, like property rights? I don't know, talk about like, in, like right to bequeath property to your children, right to inherit property. Are these rights sacred or can society intervene? Can society, you know, let's say tax inherited wealth? And, and the answer for utilitarians is if a recognized social necessity requires it, if it's in the general interest of society, yes, of course, society should have these rights. Because like the basis, the ultimate justification of any rights is utility, is common interest. Sort of, if if uh, uh, um, sort of my my right is is hurting everybody else, it's not clear if I should continue having this right. You know, or, or as a utilitarian, I, would, I, I should say, uh, <laughs> you, you you know, nobody should have a right which uh, uh, damages other people without you know increasing anything by way of common interest, right? Um, you know, like rights that go against common interest should not be protected, should not really be rights. Um, it's like you might as well have rights for you know, murderers or, or, or maniacs, right? So like if a person becomes happy by, you know, cracking skulls and splashing warm human blood on their cheeks, right? Should we, is this, is this a right worth protecting? No. What is the justification? Because it's against the common interest and I, I think that's the basic idea. Um, so, yeah. Couple more things I wanted to get out uh, with respect to this is that uh, uh, we keep talking about political freedom, and political freedom obviously is hugely important for Mill, but I also obviously for Marx. But another a, a corollary of the political freedom is economic freedom, and Mill actually addresses this head on. So uh, um, Mill says, why is it uh, um, not okay for you, for an individual, to inherit a position of a mayor, for example? Why, 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 if, like, okay, we do not, we disallow, we disallow buying and selling of uh, uh, political office. So, buying and selling political office, like the office of a mayor, for example, of a town, right? Uh, we think, this is, this, we think that this should be prohibited. And in most countries of the world today, it is prohibited. You cannot buy your way into politics in a straightforward fashion. But why is buying and uh, uh, so buying and selling uh, economic office? Why is that different? Why 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 can you why can you not buy your way into political power? But why can you buy your way into uh, uh, economic power? You know, economic power and political power. You know, sim broadly speaking, similar things. Why is it? Uh, not all right for, uh, let's say, a president to bequeath 
their uh, presidency to their children. We don't think that's okay in most democratic countries of the world. But why do we think it's okay for people to leave wealth to their children, right? So we, we again, like, mm, uh, uh, well, you could say, uh, look, the person worked very hard to amass their wealth. Okay, they worked. They also worked very hard, hard to achieve, uh, you know, political positions. But we don't think that's okay. Or, or let's say, you know, I am a university professor. Let's imagine I decide I want to bequeath my university professorship to to my child. Is that okay? Most people say, no, of course that's not okay. But look, I worked for this university professorship all my life, but we as a society, we don't think that's fine. So why should I not be able to allow, you know, why should I not be able to bequeath my professorship, but I should be able to bequeath, you know, economic power that I amass, right? So in, in, uh, uh, in, this, in, in both, and I, is this an argument for socialism? No, not exactly, because for Mill, at the end of the day, the question between socialism and capitalism, let's say, is, is simply a, uh, uh, is a technical question. So capitalism or socialism, uh, it is merely a technical question of what is mo more efficient. And Mill is not exactly a socialist, but uh, he is sympathetic to certain forms of socialism, especially to these things, uh, uh, worker cooperatives. Worker cooperatives. Again, this uh, um, demo de if you want democracy in the workplace. And I think that at the end of the day, there's, at least the way I see it, there's more similarity between Mill and Marx as opposed to, um, you know, what people usually think. Also, um, so, okay, okay, I've been going on for quite some time. But let, let me address another issue, which I sort of <laughs> wanted to get back to in the previous slide, but, you know, finally, <laughs> I, I remember what was on my mind. So we talk about equality. Um, and the question is, you know, why is equality a value at all, right? So I, I pressed something and everything disappeared. Whoops. That's not good. Yeah, so I mentioned a second ago, right? So this idea that by equality by itself are completely, by, is completely worthless, but certain kinds of equality are instrumentally valuable for freedom. And so, again, notice, uh, utilitarianism presupposes the greatest happiness principle. So we are talking about greatest uh, happiness of the greatest number. And notice, each individual counts as one. Each counts as one. And the question is why? Why? What is the justification for this? And I think, you know, in, in many ways, I think this is a very important topic. I am not sure I will be able to explain this clearly. I have a clear picture in my head, and I also think that it's, it's also a, like a, an important thing worth explaining. So I, I need to try. I need to try. So let me, let me try, right? So... Mm, Again, imagine we have like a small village and, uh, I don't know, 50 individuals. We come to the town meeting and I say, you know what? Up until this point, we had this policy, one person, one vote, sort of everybody counts as, 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 as one individual. But from now on, I think that uh, only people with red hair should count as full citizens. And everybody who doesn't have red hair, they should, be, should, should count as you know, half a citizen. Their vote should count as a half, and their utility in our utility, utilitarian calculation should count as a half. Now, I think intrinsically there's, there's a problem with this kind of logic, right? Because it means suddenly that everybody who doesn't have red hair, in an important sense, is not a member of your society anymore. So, you see, it's like uh, if you want to talk to people in a, again, for, for Mill, you have this very important phrase, free and open discussion. If you want to have a, an, a free and open political discussion, you have to treat people as equals. Everybody has to count as the same. Otherwise, they, they are not party to your society. They are not members of your society. They are not members of your discussion. So in many ways, I think that the root of this idea of, again, like each individual counts as, 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 as one person, each individual counts equally, there, it's, it's not really as much about equality. So it's less about equality and more about reciprocity. Mm. So it's like, um, compare this to the golden rule. Uh, 
right? So do unto others as you, as, as you would them do unto you. Do unto others as you would them do unto you. There's a certain idea of reciprocity. And if you want, there's a certain idea of equality embedded in that statement. Uh-huh. Do to others equally as you would prefer them to do to you equally, right? So there's a certain equality, right? An eye for an eye, one eye is equal to one eye. Uh, you know, a, a tooth for a tooth. A tooth is equal to a tooth. And again, it's not like, like we need to get out, get, get out of our head this image of Kalkhoz and Stalin and Gulag, because, you know, this is, it's, 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 I think it's very misleading to think about equality in these terms. Yeah, okay, we can all be equally poor or equally dead or equally starving, equally oppressed. That's, these are not the kinds of equality we're looking for, right? So, but, so, like, the, the, it's like, it's less about equality, it's more about fairness, I guess, right? So you want to have a free and equal discussion. You have to treat people fairly, you have to treat them on equal terms. So, free and equal equal discussion presupposes fairness, presupposes equality of terms. Like, it, it, seem, it seems to be an intrinsic nature of dialogue, intrinsic uh, nature of a dialogue, right? When, when, when two people are having a conversation, for this to be really a conversation, there needs to be an, um, an important element of parity. There needs to be an important element of reciprocity in a conversation. If you want an important element of equality understood in, in this particular sense. So this is what I wanted to get out, right? So this, this is why in the calculations of utility, every person has to count as, you know, the same amount. Otherwise, we are not having a free and equal discussion. You know, if somebody counts less or, or, or doesn't count at all, then we, we're not having a free and equal discussion. It means we have slaves and masters. And then the slaves can ask this question. Why the heck do I want to be a part of this society? Why the heck would I want to be a part of this society? Again, this Rousseauian question. Sort of, again, that the only force that a free citizen recognizes is the peculiarly unforced force of the better argument and not, uh, 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 again, this mm, coercive power. Okay, okay, okay. I've been going for quite a while. I, I need to try to wrap this up somehow. Um, there are ideas in Mill. Uh, nationalism is an important idea. It's like, um, mm, mm, mm. I don't want to talk about this for, for long, but a big problem, um, I think, in terms of... In, envisioning the transition uh, to a brighter future is this notion that Mill, Mill is going to say that in order to really make utilitarianism work, your society needs to be relatively small. Like, the larger your society gets, the harder it is to align the interest of the individual and the interest of the whole. But the problem is that it's like damned if you do, damned if you don't. You need nations in order to promote solidarity. But if you have nations, now you have competition between nations. So how can you... like like? And, and Marx is going to talk about how it's very important to have cooperation between states, among states, uh, uh, along the state lines, and, and how competition between states, how nationalism actually, you know, seems to be the biggest barrier to uh, communism. So let me, let, me, let, me, let me try to rewrite this. So um, nationalism seems to be integral or indispensable, like necessary. For utilitarianism to work, let's say necessary, but at the same time, nationalism, um, I can't spell, but it's okay, um, seems to preclude a transition to communism. And I would say uh, uh, so most most importantly, so okay, it seems to preclude international peace. International peace, uh, and th and therefore pre preclude a transition to communism. Um, but without international peace, it seems to me. 
that utilitarianism can't work in one nation. Can't work. So this it's a it's a problem. It's a catch twenty two. And I am not sure how to resolve this. In fact, in fact, uh, you know, for my money, this is the biggest problem in political philosophy in the twenty first century. So let me write. So I feel that this is the biggest problem in political philosophy of. 21st century. Uh, 21st century political philosophy. <sighs> okay, okay, okay. Um, I think there was one last thing I wanted to mention. I'm sure there was one last thing I wanted to mention. Oh yeah, oh yeah, oh yeah. Let's 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 talk let's talk for five seconds about uh, prisons and responsibility. So this would be Mill versus Kant. I don't exactly feel very energized to have this con this particular conversation right now. So maybe maybe you know uh, <laughs> at a later point um, when I feel more enthusiastic about this, I'll give you a, a more vivid presentation. But you see, Kant has this interesting idea. Um, of how morality should really be uh, about freedom, right? So Kant thinks that morality is about freedom. And immediately you can ask this question, yeah, but what about prisons? How are, you know, how can prisons, so how can prisons de deter crime? How then can prisons deter crime? So it's like, it seems, oh, many people would say, look, if there's no freedom, you cannot punish criminals. And I want to say, in an important Kantian sense, no, you cannot punish criminals. My own feeling is that Kant is wrong. Humans don't have free will. Can this idea of, uh, um, I should talk about this. I should talk about this more sometime, right? So when, when, we, when we talk about freedom, there's a political meaning of the word freedom. Uh, the, the kind of uh, the kind of uh, kind of freedom I've been talking about this whole uh, class. So this political freedom uh, in terms of rights, basically, and then there's this uh, um, freedom of the will. Uh, so political freedom versus freedom of the will. Which is I don't know metaphysical, uh, metaphysical concept, which refers to you know human beings being uncaused, right? And so it's it's a, it's an important distinction to keep in mind. Uh, I should I should talk about this some more. I, hopefully, most of you understand what the d difference is, but you know I need I need I need to devote some time in class to explain this in more detail because this this is this is honestly an important distinction, right? Um, you can have one without the other, right? So John Stuart Mill believes in political freedom, but he doesn't believe in freedom of the will. So this is what I'm talking about, sort of, again. So political freedom is, is contrasted with slavery, so uh, uh, as opposed to slavery, mm, and uh, um, metaphysical freedom is contrasted with uh, determinism. I hope this is clear enough. Maybe. Wow. <laughs> it's not going to work, is it? Um, why? Anyway, so... Um, Okay, 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 okay. Let me go back to Kant. Mm. Yeah, so morality is about freedom, but I ask, how then can prisons deter crime, right? So 
Kant is going to say, uh, if criminals don't have free will, then uh, punishment is immoral. And I think what Mill would retort is to say, yes, punishment, understood as revenge, is immoral. Uh, Mill would say, we should punish, like, again, so, like, prisons, prisons um, are fine, basically, uh, for, for, you know, for the purposes of quarantine, um, so prisons are fine um, as uh, quarantine institutions. So we want to quarantine, we want to, like, well, prisons are fine as self-defense, basically. So society self-defense. Quarantine and, um, and prevention. And notice, again, I, I, I mentioned this already, right? So Kant says that morality is about freedom, but actually, how then can prisons deter a crime? And Mill would say that prisons work, Mill would say that prisons work only because human beings work like clocks. Only because humans work or operate, behave, behave like clocks, right? And you can, you, can, you can tell a person, don't do this, otherwise you'll go to jail. And because people are ruled by passions, so people are ruled by passions, and we have a passion, we don't want to go to prison. We don't want to go to prison. Right? And so we, we stop committing crimes. Right? And also notice that for Kant, it seems that there's this value of free choice. So morality is about free choice. Morality is about free choice. But for, uh, for Mill, no. Or for Mill and Hume, Morality is not about free choice. And uh, say hi to Hume's uh, uh, artificial virtues. So let me do it this way. So compare to Hume's artificial virtues. Morality is not, well, actually, say hi to Hume, but also, also, say hi to Aristotle. Aristotle has a similar idea, that morality is not about choice. Morality is about habit. It's like... When you, you remember this example from the home assignment, I think, or something, this, ex, this oh yeah, yeah, this is, this is an example from the home assignment on Hume, right? This idea that you're walking down the street, you're walking down the street, and you see in front of you uh, a person who dropped their, vo their wallet. So a person in front of you drops their wallet. And the question is, what do you do? So it seems that the Kantian picture is you stop and you deliberate, you decide. Should you pick up the wallet? Should you give the wallet back? Right? And Kant thinks this is how morality operates. And for Mill, if somebody drops a wallet in front of you and you have to stop and think about whether to take it or not, you are not a moral person. A moral person is somebody who automatically, without thinking, shouts, hey, mister, you dropped a wallet, or hey, miss, you dropped a wallet. Right? Please take it back. Right? So uh, 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 um, imagine this example example of somebody dropping a wallet, right? And so for Kant, it seems that we're talking about, again, this free choice to give them their wallet back. And, and a good person is the one who sort of, after struggling with themselves, after struggling with their horrible, sinful human nature, decide, no, I should give them the wallet back. And Mill says, no, morality is about, is, is about habit, is about doing the right thing without thinking about it. And this is, this is why, this is why, of course, habit is a result of education which is the result of education. And so at the end of the day, uh, um, at the end of the day, education is a very problematic notion because this is why in order to be moral, you need to be a member of a well-ordered society. So morality, so morality uh, uh, is a question of membership in a well-ordered society, right? Mm, so you can be moral only in a well-ordered society society. And again, this is, what, this is what Aristotle would also say. It's like, yeah, something along those lines. Anyway, anyway, uh, 
I feel that there's a million other things I wanted to mention, but these are probably the most important ones. Um, well, okay, while we're at it, let me... So morality is about habit, but morality is also about passions, right? So there's, there's this famous, very famous uh, epigram of uh, uh, Schiller uh, uh, against Kant, where Kant um, very famously, right, well, again, very famously says that you should do good things only, so Schiller's epigram against Kant. So you should do good things only out of respect, so you can only act out of respect for the moral law, only out of respect for the moral law. And Schiller makes fun of Kant. He says, yeah, what this would come down to is this idea that uh, uh, because you're always plagued by doubt, whether you're moral or not, Schiller says that the safest way to be sure that you are moral, so to be sure that you are moral, you should hate your friends with a passion, hate your friends with a passion, and then you can be sure, then you can be sure that you act, you are acting, then it's clear you're acting, uh, you are acting only out of mm, respect for the moral law and not inclination and not passion. And basically, so what would what would what would Mill say? Mill would say, "No, no way. We 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 do good to our friends. We do good to friends because it feels good." And you know, I feel that uh, uh, this this is this is this is all that I need to say against Kant's, against Kant's philosophy. This is, for me, I, okay, this is not a knockdown argument. There's no such thing as a knockdown argument in, uh, in philosophy. But <laughs> this much is enough to show to me the deep and pro deeply problematic and deeply inhuman nature of, of Kantian philosophy. Even if categorical imperative somehow did work, which I don't think it does, but even if it did work, <laughs> we're looking at morality, which is deeply inhuman, right? So, so at the end of the day, okay, it's like, again, morality has to be, morality has to be rooted for Mill, morality rooted uh, uh, um, in common interest, concretely defined um, as happiness, which is defined as uh, happiness, so happiness associated with higher pleasures, which are non-rival. I can enjoy them and you can enjoy them at the same time and which are defined as a a permanent interest of man as a progressive being. Wonderful phrase, and I should probably finish this. Permanent interest of man as a progressive being. And colleagues, that's it. John Stuart Mill, love him, read him, write about him on your exam next year. Okay, I hope this was uh, um, somewhat fun, hopefully stimulating. Hopefully, you'll find it useful. As always, thank you so much for your wonderful company. Uh, uh, this would have been impossible without you. Again, you see this idea of uh, uh, <laughs> non-rival pleasures. This, you know, this is a follow-up to the lecture. Something I do in my spare time for fun, for, to experience, experience an exquisite higher pleasure of giving a philosophy lecture. And notice, in this, you are not my enemies. In fact, you are my friends. In fact, the whole world is my friend. I'm uploading this to YouTube for everybody to enjoy. And the more people watch it, the better. And if people criticize it and maybe improve upon it, even better, I will be even happier. So uh, I'm not just talking the talk, I'm also walking the walk, in an important sense, or so I think. So as always, as always, thank you. Uh, uh, sincerely thank you for your uh, company. If you have any questions, I would be more than happy to answer right now in Microsoft Teams. Um, otherwise, uh, uh, um, again, um, thank you so much. I will see you next time. And as always, colleagues, please take care. Take care.